never watch that without my heart being moved. I could read this passage to you and tell you all the context, the historical setting. I could tell you all the reasons that Jesus had to address the things that he addressed with her. And it, you would leave here with your brains full of more information. And while the chosen, I don't believe, is the Bible, they never intended it to be the Bible, I believe it is a very, if not accurate, a very moving dramatization of exactly what happened that day. Today I want to talk to you about being free of shame, and I'm going to skip the context. I normally try to unpack that. I've done that several times before for you, but I think that it's already been set, and I think you can understand. I love the last phrase that Jesus says to her, one of the last things he says. She says, you've come to the wrong person, and he says, I came here especially for you. I love this text from John chapter 4. I especially love it in the King James, which is, of course, my first reading of that verse so many years ago. I didn't understand King James, but it was the holy language of the time. And when Jesus talks about going to Samaria, the disciples actually say, listen, that's kind of out of our way. And, you know, those Samaritans, they, are, um, they had a few things to say. And, and Jesus says it this way. This is only in the King James. It says, I must needs go. <laughs> it's like, dude, learn some English, right? But he's Jewish, so uh, it's okay. And plus it's translated from, you know. But I must go this direction. I know I can take the bypass and miss those people that worship God differently, that, that their women intermarried because their men had all been killed. So in the Babylonian times they married pagans and adopted some pagan practices i know i can skip them all together but the father is sending me to that well for this moment number one in your handout by the way if you didn't get a handout when you came in please lift your hand right now and we'll make sure you get those Someone's waiting to bring them. Online, you can download the notes as well. And by the way, thank you for joining us online. It's such a pleasure to know that you're with us. Several of you have mentioned this morning and uh, said hello this morning from various locations. We're delighted to have you, and uh, God bless you. The notes are there available for you as well, as, as well as our pastor who covers online, and that's Pastor Vince. He's there, and he's there to care for you, minister to you, and encourage your heart as well. Number one in your handout this is the thing I've discovered about Jesus, I'm sure you have too, and that is that Jesus seems to specialize in what we would call chance encounters. You ever notice that? Throughout the Bible, I mean, story after story after story, episode after episode after episode, when you read the Gospels, we find Christ encountering people that weren't expecting to meet the Messiah. And like this woman who, because of her social standing, because perhaps of her moral standing, but especially because of her ethnicity and the fact that she's a woman. When she meets Jesus, she doesn't see a Messiah. She sees a man, a Jewish man, who looks down upon her from her expectation, who is honestly viewing women as if they are possessions, not God's creatures. And I know that in our society, we've had those moments. In fact, I believe we're also in one of those moments now. Not that I want to make a social statement, but I believe that womanhood is under attack in major ways again. And we should make every effort to stand with our women and cover them in prayer, as well as our children and our nation. Jesus specializes in chance encounters. And I want to talk to you today about this chance encounter because I believe this has more to do with most of us than we realize. We've been talking for the last several weeks about letting go, letting go of things that separate us. The writer of Hebrews said it this way. He said, if you keep your eyes focused on the author and the finisher of your faith, you'll be able to, to let go of those weights, those, those things that weigh you down and slow your progress down in Christ, you'll be able to turn loose of those things and be able to embrace and enjoy and receive this abundant life that Christ intended you to receive. And so as we think about these thoughts this morning, as we walk through some of these verses this morning, I'm not going to retell, the, I'm going to try not to retell the story. It's hard for me. I'm going to try not to retell the story, but I want to kind of bring 
to light the gospel in it for you. This woman had lived a life of shame. She was in a place of shame. She was in a place of isolation. Her actions, her circumstances, her reactions to those circumstances, the community that she was in, all those things conspired to cause her shame to become a prison of isolation. And I think that happens for us so much more than we realize. And and maybe that's not your story this morning. Maybe you're on the other side of that story, but perhaps you know someone else who is still struggling, who is still working through those issues. When I think about this woman and I think about this encounter, I recognize myself in it, not that my story is like her story, but my story is one that when I first met Christ, and I've told you this before, I it was a very young man, seven years old. I was a boy, a lad. A lad, that's kind of an old word, isn't it? I was a lad back when I... No, God, stop, stop. Stop it. But at seven years old, there's a lot of stuff you don't know. I mean, the worst thing I'd done was take cookies from my sister consistently all the time. Especially the oatmeal and raisin. But anyway. I didn't understand what life was going to send my way, but by the time I was 18... I found myself in a very different place where I now viewed God as my judge because at seven, there wasn't a lot of consciousness about sin. But by the time I hit 17, 18, I had made some decisions. I had reacted to some circumstances, reacted to some things that happened in my life. And now I was at a place where I felt less loved, less worthy, less competent to stand before God. And so I viewed him now as my judge, not as my Savior. Anybody else ever realized or felt that way? I think many of us have. And so I see myself in her reflection. I see myself in her moment. I was trapped in a, in a, in a cage of shame, isolated. In fact, I could tell you why people would reject me before they rejected me. And because I could tell you that and had set myself up for that, I then began to reject. Because how many of you know it's easier to be the rejector than the rejectee? At least you can control that. Which is a little bit what we see in her life, isn't it? As she's talking to Messiah, she begins to, to position herself to reject him and not receive him even as a prophet. If I just keep him at bay, then I won't come under that guilt, under that shame. But Jesus, man, he blows everything. All of her questions, all of her excuses, all of those things she's hidden behind and taken on as her identity, he just blows right past them. And he conveys to her what I believe is one of his primary messages from the Father everywhere he goes. In fact, just a chapter earlier, John chapter 3, he's speaking to Nicodemus, who is a, is, is a very high rabbi, very venerated rabbi. And, and, and he says to Nicodemus, John 3, 16, you know this verse as well as I do. He says, listen, for God so, what? Love. The world that he gave his only begotten son his only son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life that's not where he stops and often we memorize that especially as children we memorize that verse and we say it to ourselves we quote it we share it with others when we're talking about christ but verse 17 is just as powerful and here we see it enacted in 3d for us as Jesus approaches this woman who, in her own mind, has already been written off by society and by God. And what does he say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. He says that he sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's his message everywhere he went. It didn't matter how difficult or how, how depraved or how broken he didn't look at their credentials. He didn't look at whether they had earned the right to stand there. He, he invaded their darkness. I love what 1 John says, same writer, different book. He says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest to undo the works of the devil. 
And maybe you're trapped in some of those places right now. I want you to know that he's not coming. You're not in this place, and I'm not preaching this message so that you'll feel condemned or know how bad a person you are. I don't have to tell you that. You tell yourself that every single day. If you're listening online, you know what I'm saying is true. Just when you stood this morning and brushed your teeth, thoughts went through your mind as to why God could not love you. In fact, if you're sick this morning, if you're frustrated this morning as some big problems happening you probably reasoned in your mind that you deserve that very thing and owned it that's really what the enemy wants for you take this identity rather than what god has for you that's the message that christ brought everywhere in fact there's another story in luke chapter 19 i won't turn there but it's a story of a a little guy who he climbs up a tree you remember the story from sunday school i'm sure he climbs up a tree he's a tax collector everybody hates him one because he's a tax collector two because he's different three because he's a cheat (laughs) He, he cheats people on their taxes nothing worse than to find out you've been cheated on your taxes. Not even by the government, but by... Anyway, he's climbed up the tree to see Jesus. You remember the story, and maybe you could even sing that old song. And Jesus approaches that sycamore tree. (laughs) And he looks at Zacchaeus and says, Zacchaeus, come on, help me. Come down, for I'm going to your house today. Zacchaeus, the most hated guy in the community, and Jesus says, we're going to party at your house. Let's go. Jesus invades the darkness, and at the close of this this story, as Jesus is talking and showing God's love, and something's happening, transformative is happening in Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus stands up, and he declares, I'm a sinner. I have stolen from people, but today I repent, and now I'm going to give everything I've stolen back, and if I've wronged anyone, I'm going to return it to them four times as much. Wow. And Jesus declares, salvation has come unto this house this is a miracle and then he says in verse 19 or verse 10 he says today salvation has come to this house for the son of man came to do what seek and to save the lost oh i want you to get that down in your spirit i want you to get that down don't let the enemy confuse you don't let the enemy attack your mind and don't let him stand in the way of you stepping into someone else's prison of shame not to join them in their pain but to stand with them and be the light that God's called you to be you see the grace that you've received remember at the end she says I'm going to tell everyone what I have heard today this man told me everything I've ever done Now, for many, that would be, whew, there are things I'm hoping God, I'm hoping God didn't see. Just like you. Come on, you know you got your book of shame. You know there are things that you would say, Lord, I hate to tell you this, but (laughs) he's giggling because he already knew. He's been waiting for you because you've been carrying that burden as she runs to town to tell everyone. She doesn't go because now she feels condemned. God knows me, and he loves me in spite of me. That's his message. God came to seek Jesus. God sent Jesus. Jesus, God, took upon himself humanity so that he might live among us and demonstrate and help us to understand who God is. Religion will keep you in your prison of shame, in your prison of condemnation, but Christ came that we might have life And freedom, for where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Are you with me? I've got to keep moving here because I've only covered one point. (laughs) Here's the big idea today, and I want you to get this. In fact, you're going to have to make an adjustment because I left something out. Your history, please remember this, your history does not have to That really needs to be put in there. I should have left a space, Josh. Because the reality is, your history does determine your future, your destiny. It does. If you have not reconciled your history with Christ. He died for your sins. He paid the price for your sins. But the only way that is applied to you is for you to receive that freely. And so if you're wrestling with, 
where you are and what you've done, once you bring it to Him and place it under His gracious blood that was shed for you, we celebrated that in our communion this morning. Once that happens, God says He removes that. Once we repent, we turn from our old way and turn to Him, He not only removes the guilt that leads to shame, but He removes the power that sin had over you. Your history does not have to determine your destiny. I think this is a powerful thought that Jesus reveals to this woman at the well, which, by the way, we're going to see this really played out in a moment, and that is the fact that Jesus knew her story before she began telling it. In fact, she didn't have to tell her story. He knew it. And here's what's really important about that, because I want you to understand and realize that this is not just a Bible story. This was given to us as an example so that we might understand how God works, how this kingdom thing works. And the fact is, not only did Jesus know her story, but I want you to understand Jesus knows your story. He knows your story. You might say, wait a minute. How could he know my story? I'm not a Christ follower. I've never, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of a, I'm just window shopping today. <laughs> I'm just checking this out. I don't even know why I'm here. I can tell you why you're here. Just like Jesus ended up in Samaria out of his way to meet this woman at the well. You're here because he has placed this moment before you that you might meet him. And no, I'm not going to stand up here and point at you and say, I know your story. I'm not going to tell everybody your secrets. It's not about you and me. It's about you and Him. God didn't come to reconcile you to me or me to you. He came to reconcile us to Him. Go ahead and give the Lord some praise. That's a good place to do that. He knows your story. Now, that's good in a lot of different reasons. For, for one reason or one point, you don't have to... Like in the Garden of Eden, you don't have to make up an excuse. That happened in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve. You don't have to turn to that, by the way. They, Adam and Eve, they made a mess of things. They disobeyed God, and immediately once they take it of the fruit, you remember the story in the Garden, that first creation story. The Bible says that when they took of the fruit, their eyes were open, and they ran and hid and started quickly making for themselves garments out of leaves. And as they were busy feeling the shame and the guilt and the condemnation and recognizing that immediately they were naked. Now just get with me real for a moment. There's only two of you, but you've never seen one another naked. There are some prizes that are coming up. Shocks are about to happen. Immediately your eyes are open and you no longer see the glory of God, but you see each other as you really are. I've seen that image in the mirror and it's not pretty. It's shocking. That's the moment that they went and they began thinking, immediately began working it through in their mind. What are we going to do? This is terrible. And they're hiding themselves from each other. They're looking at each other in guilt. They're looking at each other in shame. They're looking at each other, and it's not, whoa, hey, baby. It's, it's immediately, it's like, what have we done? And chance encounters with God. The other thing I noticed about the chance encounters with God is that not only does God know my story, but it seems like those chance encounters always come at the worst possible moment. <laughs> they hadn't even finished fixing up their garment, and the voice of the Lord, they hear Him, Walk into the garden. And what does he do? Hey, Adam. By the way, when he said Adam, he spoke to both of them. It was Adam's family. Hey, Adam. That was their name, male and female. They heard his voice. They recognized his voice. It had been the only voice they had listened to until that moment. And suddenly they hear his voice. At the vi you ever been doing something and your mama came in? What are you doing? 
It didn't matter what you, sometimes I can do it now. I can say it to my kids, they're grown. I can say, what are you doing? And immediately they're like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> I'm balancing my check. I'm reading a book. I'm praying. What are you talking about? Because we're kind of prone to that, aren't we? And then immediately they come out before God and they start making excuses. That's what religion does. We try to balance our actions with God and we try to get out from the guilt. But the guilt is a gift from God. Guilt is a gift from God. It reminds us of how far we've fallen or how we are separated. In fact, Jesus says this in John chapter 16. He says, when the Holy Spirit comes to you, He will bring conviction. He will convict you of your sin, of your wrongdoing. He will help you to understand, here is where God is and you're over here. Guess who moved? Here's the way back. Immediately with Adam and Eve, they begin making excuses. The man said, it's the woman's fault. She had one job to make dinner and this is what she did. And the woman said, wait a minute, I asked you what you wanted, and you said you didn't care, and here we are. <laughs> That's what my wife reminds me every time we say, hey, where do you want to go to dinner? I don't care, where do you want to go? And, you know, you end up at some sleazy, the worst place possible, <laughs> and blaming each other. We're talking about shame, and how shame separates us. Guilt reminds us of the fact that God is holy and we're not. But Jesus paid the price. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that he that knew no sin, Christ, that he became sin. Now, everything that you would have ever be, said to God, God, you can't love me because of this, 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 this. All the reasons that you push him away, all the reasons that you know he judges and condemns and couldn't love you, Christ became that. Christ received the punishment, the, the judgment, the wrath of God for that so that you might become, not of your own accord, not of your own ability, but you might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Come on, girls and boys, think about that. You're no longer who you made yourself to be, but rather He sees you as He created you to be. Not because of your abilities, not because you came to church, not because of what you gave, not because of what you do, but because of what He has done for you. You don't have to say, hey, excuse the way I'm dressed today, excuse the way I look today. I'm a mess, you know, I've been struggling with this and I've been struggling with that. He understands your struggles. That's why He says, again, come unto me in Matthew 14. Come, come to me. If you're weary and heavy laden, if you're exhausted with who you are, with what life's dealt to you, with what you've become, come to me. Come. That's an intentional statement. Come. Make the effort. Draw nigh to me, James says. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. That's the word near, by the way. Draw near to me. Make the effort, and I will meet you. Come to me. And I will give you rest. Sometimes I feel like that's one of those passages that goes over and over in my messages, but I think it's a message we must hear because we're prone to say, not today, God. I'll handle it myself. I think all of us have those moments where we like the bumper sticker that says, God is my co-pilot. I'll call on him only in emergencies. Only when I need to go take a break will I surrender to Him. We pray it this way, God, I don't know what else to do. And He said, well, why did you wait to come to me at the end? I should be the first action, not your final reaction. Jesus knows your story. He knew the story of Adam. He knew the story of Eve. He knew what happened in the garden. He didn't have to ask the question, but He did. He asked the question so that they could identify, they could confess to Him, they could open their lives to Him, and that's all He asked for you and I to do. When I, even in a few minutes, when I invite you to know Him as your Lord and Savior to pray with me, there's a moment where we have to confess, God, I am a sinner, I have failed, I've gone my own way, but I'm coming home. 
John chapter 4, Jesus with the woman at the well. He didn't have to identify her. She's the very, get that, she is the very first person on the planet that Jesus says, I am Messiah. She's not Jewish. She's not a priest. She's an emotional and a moral mess. She's a woman of all things and a Samaritan. All the reasons why he should have avoided her he goes directly to her and says, I am Messiah. What does that say to me? Forgive me for using this, saying it this way, but I think Jesus picked the most messed up, the most broken, the most disqualified in anyone's mind at the furthest reaches of his geographical domain went out of his way to reach her. Do you think he would do any less for you? Do you think he would do any less for that cousin that you've been saying, God, please, if you could do something? It's just a matter of time, and they're going to have a chance encounter. But will you be ready to offer them and to guide them into reconciliation? Jesus knew your story. Jesus knows their story. He paid a price. He did not bring shame, but he also did not say, hey, it's okay. I don't care that you sinned. I don't care that you had these problems. He recognized, look, you've made some really bad decisions, and I understand that some of those were reactions to the actions of others. I understand that some of the things that you carry today are the reactions, they're the result. Some of them are just you decided to go that way, you decided to do it, but they're all the same to him, and none of them stop his love, his presence. Let me ask you a question. I mentioned earlier the Holy Spirit brings conviction upon our hearts. He helps us to come face to face with God and to identify ourselves as we are, that we don't really deserve this grace. So let me ask you, do you know the difference between guilt and shame? Because some of us don't, and we live in that place where we live under shame or we misidentify the guilt, the, the conviction of God for His condemnation. And as we saw in that, in that clip, which is why I wanted you to see it rather than me tell it, we see him not dealing with her in a shameful way, not, not pouring more shame and condemnation, but rather offering grace and an opportunity to be free. You see, a person, a person living with guilt says this, I made a mistake now just to be clear when i say i made a mistake when a sin is more than a mistake but but I, it is a mistake i mean any way you look at it i made a decision that was wrong i made a mistake i mean you know that's why god created erasers <laughs> and then later improved on that with the delete button <laughs> We're prone to make mistakes. When a person's dealing with guilt, when you make a mistake, you you know, how many times? I, I'm the guy that can make a mistake at the end of five sentences, and for some reason, I don't know what it is, I like delete all five sentences and start all over again, like I can't get past that. I need to correct it. I want to be right. Shame, on the other hand, is something different. Shame is not, I recognize I made a mistake. I recognize I'm wrong. I need to erase that, and the blood of Jesus is the only way to do that. Shame, when a person's wrestling with or living under shame, they don't say, I made a mistake. They say, rather, I am a mistake. It's not something I've done. It's now I own it. It's what I am. And before Christ comes into our hearts, we tend to identify ourselves as broken. We tend to identify ourselves as being the enemies of God, we recognize that's what the Bible says about us, but we put ourselves in that category as if God would never, could never, should never bring His light into our darkness. And oh, what a hard place that is. But how easy it is to find ourselves there. Anybody else ever? Yeah. Good. I thought maybe I was wrong. I thought it was just me for a moment there. I was feeling all kind of guilt. 
What kind of shame? No, it's the truth. It's, shame involves deep humiliation. It, it's not about what we've done now. It's about who we are. We look in the mirror and we think of ourselves and we start saying, I'm, I'm just a, and you fill in the blank, I'm just a, all kinds of words come to mind, but they all tend to push us deeper, deeper, further, further away. There's a real difference. But notice that God had no hesitation. And I say God because remember that Jesus Christ said over and over again, everything that I say, everything that I do, everywhere I go, I do so because the Father has sent me. In fact, he says, the things that I do, the healings that I do, the resurrections from the dead, the miracles that you see, the restoration of people's lives, whether it was physical leprosy or in her case, spiritual leprosy, when you see that restoration take place, I'm doing it because I first saw my father doing that. I am simply, I'm simply extending his mercy, his love, and his grace. Father's hugging them. Father's caring for you this morning. Father's saying, come unto me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. <laughs> I think I just need to get born again right now. We find that place. He wants you to hear that you're not what your labels were, but rather that you're a son, you're a daughter. Third point in your notes is this. I find that Jesus specializes not only in chance encounters, and not only does he know our story in advance, I find that he specializes, number three, I find that he specializes in transforming our tragedies into triumphs. I'm not trying to be cute with that. I mean it. I mean, my tragedies, the things that, listen, I have a list of things that people did me wrong and I got hurt and it wounded me and it rejected me and I had reasons. I, I turned to marijuana at one point in my life because I needed peace and I couldn't find it in the natural. And I didn't realize that what I was doing was doping myself. In other words, I was numbing one portion of me, but another portion was raging without restraint. And it was only by God's grace I realized that my excesses were just an, an excuse and a way of trying to self-medicate the tragedies and trying to explain away and, if, and to kind of be like, I don't care, man. When in reality, inside, I was being ripped apart. It's like some of you. He specializes, though, in transforming our tragedies into triumphs we see that at the close of that episode with christ when he says to the woman i am the christ and and she begins to realize that and she turns and instead of running and embracing him and sitting at his feet what does she do she does the same thing that everyone who comes to a saving knowledge of christ does they run immediately to every person they know and they declare come and hear the man who told me everything that I ever did. Come and meet this man, this prophet, who brought light into my darkness, who identified my shame, but relieved it by giving me hope and freedom. Come meet him. In fact, the Bible says in John 4, 39-41, that after she gave a report, many of them ran to the well. They listened to his words, and they too Believed. It says many more believed because of Christ's words to them. I often say this, Psalm 23 says that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. And I remind you over and over again, you probably think I only know certain scriptures, but the truth of it is every tragedy you go through, every heartbreak, every moment of shame and separation, everything that almost broke you, God allowed. I'm sorry, but it's just a reality. He didn't choose it for you. He didn't make you go through it, but he allowed you to go through it. And in the process of that, he's saying to you, come, come, come. And when you come, realize that there are others that are in the same condition. There are people that are still stuck in the valley, and he's not calling you out of the valley never to go back. He's saying, go back and take them by the hand and bring them to the man. 
bring them to the Father. And he will change them and trans. He specializes in transforming my tragedies into triumphs. Julie and I celebrate 40 years in just a couple of days. And I hope you'll come and be with us. Not because we want you to celebrate us, but we are celebrating a triumph. We're celebrating a triumph of 40 years together as husband and wife, living together. Not just surviving, but living, even thriving together as husband and wife my mom and dad made it 20 years and at my graduation dad took his girlfriend not my wife my mother it's part of my brokenness part of my reason for rebellion and rejecting everything and everyone well god didn't change that but he changed me the fact that i'm the product of a broken marriage the statistics are stacked against me that we should be divorced. And man, I'll tell you, there were more than one moment when there was more than one moment when that statistic seemed reasonable. Because the ways of man and the way to, ways of sin always seem reasonable at the moment. I'm not saying that to condemn you. I'm not saying that if you've been through divorce or that's not my point. My point is, is that there's all listen, victory. The promised land, the promises of God are always just the other side of compromise. Just the other side of your surrender to the easiest way. She ran and told her story. She had not even experienced the full transformation. That would come in a period of time. But she ran and told her story, and people saw the difference even at that point. They said, this is not right. This is not the woman who we see walking around town, skulking around town, trying to avoid contact. This is, something's changed. Something's happened. I want to see. I want to know for myself. Her transformation story reminds me of Hebrews it says, by faith, without it, it's impossible to please God, but through it, even some of our ancestors, the ancient ones, whose lives were not all that great, still found themselves reconciled to God and used by God. She placed her faith in this one who extended love and mercy and compassion, and it changed her so much that not only did she become the first person to know, the first human being that Jesus said, I am Messiah. She became the first person to go and declare that to her community. I told you there's a little twist to this story. And Hebrews says that God is the one who's the author and the finisher of your faith. Jesus knows your story, Trevor. And, and, and here's the thing. He knows your story, and he's still writing it. I'm so grateful that God is the eternal editor of my story. Let me tell you the rest of the story about this woman. She doesn't just go into obscurity, but she actually becomes a very prominent evangelist among the Samaritan people. In fact, she's become so influential and so such a powerful testimony that she leads not only her son, she has two sons that she leads to Christ, but also her five sisters. Now, how many of you know that winning your children is not always easy because they know you? They see you when you say one thing and do another. And in her case, they had experienced the wreckage of her life and life choices and her five sisters no doubt they were five of the women who had probably rejected her but such a transformation took place she led them to christ as well and church historians we're talking about the ancient church fathers who, who wrote about the things that took place in the first century they tell us it's actually recorded in the book fox's book of martyrs that this woman whose romanized name i can't pronounce her samaritan name but her romanized name is fotini I know it's not a great name, but it means enlightened one. I think it's very appropriate. The Bible says, not the Bible, but, but Fox's Book of Martyrs and other 
ancient historians say, that she left Samaria after she had evangelized that small area, led her family to Christ. She created a, her own ministry team, and they went over to Carthage, which, if you know anything about Carthage, is one of Rome's, you know, it's one of Rome's big deals. And they moved to Carthage, and there they began to share the gospel. And there they preached, her sons, her, her sisters, and they preached and they ministered just from that one encounter. She didn't have three years of living with Jesus. I don't know how she came to understand. I don't know what those connections were. But her life did not end in shame. Her life did not end as an adulterer or as one who couldn't keep a man. It didn't end the way it started. It didn't end the way Satan had planned. God edited her story and she became a powerful evangelist and missionary leading thousands to Christ. Fox's Book of Martyr records that in 66 AD, Nero, remember he's the guy that burned Rome and played the fiddle very badly, <laughs> the violin, <laughs> while the Rome bone. He was so disturbed by her testimony and her message that he rounded her whole family up and he martyred them every one. And for her, he threw her into a dry well to mock her conversion story. I met him at a well, and he gave me living water. And Nero threw her into a well and filled it up on top of her, bearing her alive. Now, that's not a glorious moment, except that the Bible says that she gave her life and joined the ranks of those in glory. I don't know where you're at in this story. I don't know what reached you what connected with you but i want to pray and then i want to ask you to receive enlightenment yourself if you haven't already done so those of you online listen and pray with me as well let me pray first for you and this message would have its connecting point in you father i thank you i am so grateful to you that you are not finished writing our story father whether we have we're a long way from you or we have been with you for a long time. You're still in the process of writing. You're still in the process of enlightening us and teaching us so that we can be used of you to love and extend your mercy to others. Help us, Lord, to turn the page of our hearts from guilt to repentance, to receive forgiveness of our sin. And God, especially deliver us from that powerful Dem demonic domain of shame that says we'll never be anything but a failure. Jesus, come in. Come into our darkness and make it light. Now, if you keep your head bowed for one more moment, for one more prayer, if you're with us online or you're here in this room and God's been speaking to your heart. Maybe you're feeling a little bit of that conviction. Maybe Holy Spirit is helping you to feel you're not as close to Him as you should be. Maybe you've drifted away. Maybe you've never known Him and you're feeling that separation, the weight of your failures, your mistakes, your sin, the Bible calls it. Right now is a moment for you to turn. That's what repent means. It means to turn from your ways and turn back to His ways it doesn't matter whether you've known him before. It doesn't matter whether you've never known him and you have all kinds of misconceptions in your mind. He simply says to you today, come. Come unto me if you're weary. Come to me if you're heavy laden. Come to me if you're burdened. Come to me if you feel guilty. Come to me if you feel shame. Come. I will not reject you, but rather I will receive you as my son and as my daughter. And if that's you... I want to pray a prayer. In fact, we'll all pray this prayer together. But if you pray this prayer and mean it in your heart, I'm telling you, if you have faith, faith simply is confidence, not in your ability, but God's ability to do for you what he did for Fotini. His ability to deliver you from all your past failures and decisions and to give you peace with him. If you believe he can do that, things will change like that for you. Here's the prayer. And if you're praying this for the first time, would you just lift your hand unto the Lord? And that'll help me. I want to pray for you. I want to meet you and talk with you. Thank you. God bless you. So let's pray this prayer together. Dear Lord Jesus, 
I admit that I have sinned and I need your forgiveness. I believe, Lord, that you lived. I believe that you died for me. And I believe that you have come to reconcile me with God. And I receive that gift in Jesus' name. I confess to the world that you are my Savior, that you have forgiven my sins, and that you live in my heart. From this day forward, I will serve you in Jesus' name. Everyone said together, as you stand to your feet, Amen, amen. Let's give the Lord some praise. Come on, God bless you. Amen. Lift your hands. I want to bless you. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, please stay with me. I'd love to talk with you just for a moment. But let me bless you as I send you out. May the Father of heaven, may you feel his embrace today. And as I speak these words from the scriptures, may they wrap your heart with confidence in who he is and where you are with him. Now may the Lord bless you. And may the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause His face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May He cause His countenance to rise upon you and give to you His peace in Jesus' name. And everyone said together, amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you. Thank you for being with us. Look forward to seeing you next weekend. God bless you all. You're dismissed.